to do. Okay, so let's do begin. And Haroon, welcome so much for giving your time and your sharing. And hi, Charlie. Oh, there he is. There's Charlie. Don't answer it, uh, Charlie. He <laughs> <I> did. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much. And thank you again. Um, I am, uh, I shared this before, but thank you for giving one of the speeches and the, uh, the, the from the heart message on the January 6th remembrance down there on City Hall's Plaza, the very cold day there. And uh, connecting with you was very special for me. And that's why I want to, oh, I want to learn more from you. And to, uh, and so that's why this is here. Our session is participatory, meaning conversational as much as possible, question and answer, and as many questions and comment and comments that we can include uh, as an organizer, the better for me. So let's really try to hit give and take, give and take, and the uh, um, we'll uh, just dive in and, and share and learn and and uh, see where we travel together. Here tonight. So Haroon, I want to, is the old guy here, I want to uh, be the first to say that, is this backwards in it, what it appears to no, me? No, it looks right. It's okay. right. Oh, it, it looks right. Yeah. It's backwards nice. for me. So the <laughs> um, uh, How to Be a Muslim, an American story. Uh, I am about 100 pages in, Haroon. I'm not complete yet. But I love this book. And part of it is that I realized as an old guy that I've never really dove in to understand uh, Islam and Muslim traditions and history. And I just never have done that. And I'm embarrassed to admit it, but I never have. But it's through you, through the personal contact with you that I was enthused to pick up the book. And then the book is so far from dry. It is so interesting with your narrative and your writing skill is, I think, is extremely interesting, fascinating, how you, you turn corners real beautifully and include very poignant stories and about your life and about the, the Muslim tradition and all, um, and heritage and rules and uh, stories, but also the humor. I loved it that you included humor, sometimes self-deprecating, if that's our self humor about yourself, uh, which is sprinkled through, which is great. What inspired you to write this so important book? I want to make sure everyone knows how to, how to be a Muslim, an American story by Haroon. What inspired you and what did you discover uh, in the writing of the book? Well, first, uh, Richard, thank you so much for having me. Uh, and, and thank you, everyone, for making time on a, a very rainy, gloomy <laughs> Thursday evening. Uh, right. But, uh, you know, um, I, I really appreciate it. And, and I'll start uh, by way of uh, a brief introduction or, or caveat, I guess I should say, or, or I don't know what the right term is, uh, which is funny because I'm I'm supposed to be the writer and here I am looking <laughs> for a word and unable to find it. But uh, what I, I did want to say is, uh, you know, I, the American Muslim community is quite small, uh, and so chances are most folks uh, don't have many chances to interact on a you know sustained level with uh, Muslims. So if you have any questions about you know a either anything I'm saying that doesn't make sense because sometimes we say things and assume that they're understood and they're not, uh, by all means you can uh, I mean you know I guess you can raise a hand. Richard can call on you or you can type in the chat box to me whatever is. You know, I, I've not been to one of these events before, uh, but whatever is most uh, sure. uh, convenient and, and uh, comfortable for you. And the second thing is, if there's any other question you have that's not being addressed, uh, you by all means should ask it. Uh, I nothing can offend me. I'm I'm being you know totally honest. Uh, I I've you know I've been doing this for you know since before 9-11 and you know especially after 9-11 and as you can imagine there's lots of charged questions and I'd rather that you feel comfortable asking me than you know maybe just wandering around the internet for half an hour and seeing what pops up which sometimes is a little horrifying um so as a as a disclaimer I will say uh you know feel free to, to ask me anything and and don't feel like if it's not immediately present in what I'm saying that it can't be raised or shouldn't be raised or it's inappropriate to raise. I, I don't, I'm, I'm a very big believer in having open-ended conversations. Yes. Uh, 
but yeah, I mean, you know, in, in terms of, of the, the book, you know, first of all, thank you so much for the kind words. Uh, that was almost exactly five years ago that it was published uh, by Beacon Press. I actually have another one coming out in April, yes. uh, which is a little bit more of a, an academic book, a little bit more uh, traditionally pedagogical. This was a much more personal uh, effort and memoir. Uh, in terms of what inspired me to write it, uh, I, I guess I can start with self-effacing humor. I, I grew up in Connecticut and when I was about 16, my, my father uh, sent me for summer classes at Yale. And that was my first exposure to an academic setting in any sustained way. And I took a couple classes, philosophy and sociology, and absolutely loved it and, and decided right then and there that I was going to go to Yale. And that was, you know, that was the school for me. And I guess it's hard not to fall in love with a campus like Yale. It's a, if you've <laughs> ever been, it's a, you know, it's a spectacularly beautiful, very, very old institution. And uh, I, got a, I got a letter of recommendation from a professor at Yale. I had Yale courses on my transcript and, you know, of course, got rejected by Yale. Um, so, so that one kind of hurt. Yes. And, you know, I, I, I nursed that grievance a little bit, but, you know, I, I, wasn't too, I wasn't dwelling on it too much. And then fast forward, uh, you know, about three years and I was a senior at New York University and, and that's when 9-11 happened and that kind of thrust me into wow. the position of being this kind of public Muslim, which I'm, I'm happy to talk about more uh, if, it, if it comes up or if it's of interest. Uh, but suffice it to say, I, I basically spent, you know, the, the, the 20, almost 21 years since then uh, in this position of, uh, of talking about Islam and Muslims to uh, diverse American audiences and trying to intervene in some really important debates. And about after 12 years of doing this, I got an email from Yale Press. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they said, hey, you know, we've been following your work and, and would you like to write a book? And Did I you thought, turn them down? You've got to be kidding me, right? Like, hey, you here. rejected me. Did you turn yeah, them down and right? say nah? And, and I was like, of course I would. And you know, <laughs> I, I plan to dedicate it to the admissions committee and, you know, <laughs> just, just, you know, just get that book out there and, and spent uh, a couple of years writing. They basically said they wanted to do an introduction to American religions and Islam would be the first one and, and I would write the book and I decided to write an introduction to American Islam with a lot of memoir in it because I thought it would make it more accessible and yes. relatable. And I thought it would be an easy entry point for people into uh, you know, that, uh, that experience, which might be unfamiliar to some. And uh, you know, sent it in. And of course, you know, as, <laughs> as fate, God and the universe would have it, uh, <laughs> a couple weeks later, I, I got a rejection. <laughs> and uh, they said, you know, thank you very much. But uh, uh, I remember I was on 34th and 8th. I was near Penn Station in New York City when I got the email on my phone. And they basically said, look, you know, it, it, it's sort <laughs> of like, it's a book that can't make up its mind. Is it an academic book or is it a yeah. memoir? And you need to figure out which of the two it's supposed to be and then write that book. Uh, but as it stands, it's not for us. We were looking for something more academic. So you can either yeah. write an academic book or write a memoir and, and tell us. And I remember I went to see, oh goodness, now I'm forgetting. Uh, I was so distraught and frustrated. I mean, it was, you know, two years of writing and yeah. just to get it like slapped in the face like that, that I went, I just walked to a movie theater on 30, 34th and 9th and went in to see some terrible movie about a vampire or something. And I remember <laughs> crying during the movie thinking to myself, like this thing made millions of dollars and cost millions of dollars. Like someone decided to make this and this is awful, but no one's going to publish my book, right? Yeah. Like what kind of injustice is this? And, you know, but it was good. I, I calmed down and, and I went back to the drawing board and I realized I wanted to write a memoir. I reached out to a friend who reached out to Beacon Press uh, and uh, there you have it. And, and yeah. that's how the book kind of kind of came to pass. Yeah. Wow. Good. Thank you. Um, highly recommend. I mean, I'm fascinated by it. And Thank I'm, you. you know, I'm a pretty, pretty, pretty picky writer and uh, uh, so, or uh, reader. So who's next with a question or comment for Haru? Yes, Marty. Oh, I'd just like to know more about your background and family and how uh, your, I assume your family were immigrants. Where did they come from? And so Sure, sure. So, uh, you know, um, after 9-11, when I used to get trouble from some particularly unfriendly TSA agents, they would often ask me where I was really from and I would tell them I'm British, uh, which, you know, they would be very confused. And I would say, no, like really for hundreds of years, my family has been British. 
uh, which was actually not not false. I mean, not entirely true either. But you know, we were from South Asia, and given that it was a British colony, I figured it's not. You know, <laughs> is there is it really that wrong to yeah. uh, give people a history lesson? But in all seriousness, uh, so um, I grew up. Uh, I don't know if you were on at the beginning of the call, um, but I, I grew up in New England. My parents were uh, both doctors. They fit uh, pretty comfortably into uh, kind of basically if if you've studied, it's kind of a little known part of the civil rights movement and the history of, of uh, kind of how America opened up in the 1960s. But one of the consequences of the civil rights movement and one of the direct uh, initiatives pushed by civil rights leaders was to reform immigration laws. And so in, I believe 1964, 1965, uh, the United States lifted restrictions which had been in place since the early 1920s on so-called undesirable populations. And so uh, really we opened the door uh, as a country to populations from places like India, Pakistan, uh, the Middle East, uh, you know, North Africa, so on and so forth. And, and of course, East Asia and things like that. And so um, my parents came as part of that wave. Uh, they, they actually, my dad settled in the UK in the late 1960s. Uh, tried out being a doctor there uh, in his own words, uh, you know, so if you are British, I apologize, but just to give you his own context, he thought it was too racist and too provincial. And he, he couldn't, he just couldn't find a way to make it home. And, and eventually after I think about four years, uh, moved to the United States with, uh, he was newly married at the time with my mom and they settled in New York, they did their residencies. And my father uh, and my mother both got jobs as physicians uh, in, in Western Massachusetts, uh, where I was born. My father was an orthopedic surgeon. My mom was a radiation oncologist. And uh, they were part of a very small, uh, but quite, I think, dynamic and very warm Muslim community uh, in Western Massachusetts. That's where I was raised. And, uh, you know, sort of as I alluded to earlier, NYU, uh, I wanted to go to a big city for school, um, was pretty sure I would go to the University of Pennsylvania. Of course, there was Yale, but that, you know, that didn't pan out. And then <laughs> the funny thing is Penn was my, this is how delusional I was. Penn was my safety school because my brother went to Penn. So I was like, oh, well, he went to Penn. Then like, naturally, there's gonna be some sort of legacy dynamic in place. Right. And uh, I got rejected by Penn too. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's okay, later they accepted me and then I rejected them. But, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. you know, that was just, that was for my own dignity. Um, but um, in all seriousness, I, I wanted to go to a, a school in a big city. And of course, New York was about, you know, 120 miles away. So it seemed like a perfect fit. Close enough to home that I could go home if I needed to, but far enough away that I would have a little bit of a, a unique experience. I, I think I wanted to, actually, I, I don't know. I, I was very interested in law. Uh, I was interested in economics. Uh, I was interested in physics, and uh, I was very active with the Muslim population at NYU, and uh, got myself elected president of the Muslim Students Association uh, in my senior year, and that uh, that was a really exciting uh, kind of time for me. And and I remember spending a lot of the summer planning what we would do, and we we'd become like a very rapidly growing, very dynamic, very diverse group of students, about 100, 120 of us. And uh, the third day of classes was 9-11. And I found myself oh. president of the one of the largest Muslim communities and, and probably the most accessible Muslim community to, crown, uh, to Ground Zero. Uh, yeah. We were about a 30 minute walk away and we saw oh. the towers fall. And, uh, you know, that was, I, for lack of a better expression, a trial by fire. I mean, it's 21 years old and, you know, had I, not that anything really prepare anyone for that, but certainly right. at the age of 21, you're not in the least prepared for anything like that. And I think for a lot of people in my generation, uh, that was really a defining moment in the crystallization of our identities as Americans and, and as Muslims. And so I, I spent the better part of uh, 20 years in New York City uh, doing, doing the work. I'm happy to talk about that further, but uh, just to kind of get to the present, um, whether that's 2021 or 2022, depending on mm -hmm you know, what year we're, we're uh, living in right now. Yes. Um, but uh, 2021 was a good year for me. Uh, maybe not so much for, for a lot of other folks, but I actually moved to Ohio in late 2020, uh, got married. Uh, my father-in-law is on the call. Um, I, I can't scroll through the names, but, but you'll see him. Um, and uh, I, I now live in, in Southwest Ohio and uh, was introduced to Richard uh, by a mutual uh, friend and colleague. And uh, was really honored to be a small part of the January 6th remembrance. And uh, I think unfortunately because of COVID, you know, moved here, but 
you know, if you, if you move somewhere during COVID, you don't really get the chance to meet people and engage people. And I feel like it's a time where, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, we're, we're turning a corner and, and we can go back to some kind of normal sooner yeah. rather than later. I mean, you know, who knows these days, but that's the hope. And, you know, we can have conversations like this and, and lots of other things besides in person and, and get to a point, you know, sooner rather than later where we can really do this kind of work. Uh, Cause I think it's, uh, you know, uh, not to be too partisan, but, you know, we, we dodged a bullet in, you know, 2020 and there's still a lot of work to be done. You know? Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, who's next? Susan. Susan. Did you call on me? Yes. <clears throat> yes, Susan. Um, <clears throat> I visited the Gambia in West Africa and being a woman, I'm interested in the cover and um, if you could talk, because in the Gambia, the women don't cover and they have a whole sort of um, ethnic view on modesty than European women do, which I found fascinating. Um, but if you could talk a little bit about your understanding about the cover for women. Sure. Uh, you know, I mean, that's obviously it's something I'm, you know, and with all due respect to the question, so I hope it doesn't come across the wrong way. I'm just hesitant to talk about as a man because, you know, it's not really my place to opine on that. But what I, I can share a few things with you, which I, I think might be helpful or interesting. Uh, the first is, you know, in terms of how Islam spread as a religion, and I think sometimes, um, you know, it's, it's not always, you know, obviously, it, it's funny, right? Like, um, the first time I attended a mass was when I was 24. I was living in Philadelphia for a year. I was taking classes there. And I was walking home Christmas Eve. And I there was a church next to the building I lived in, a Catholic church. And, uh, you know, I kind of noticed something was going on. And I said to myself, you know, it's really a tragedy that I actually grew up in New England, which is, you know, quite Catholic. I mean, not that dissimilar from, from Southwest Ohio uh, in that respect. Um, and I'd never been to a Catholic service. And, and I thought to myself, and it was a humbling moment, you know, where, when you're a minority, you like to think you know more about the majority culture because you have to, right? Just because you, you navigate that world, right? Um, whereas if you're a majority, you don't necessarily need to know about minorities because you don't necessarily have any experiential, there's no urgency attached to that thing in a, in a kind of professional or educational sense. What I mean to say is uh, there's so much that I don't know. Uh, and, and so, you know, it, it was funny that to me, that was my first exposure to, you know, the largest faith denomination in the United States. And uh, um, it, it was really eye opening. And, you know, by no means am I any kind of expert in Catholicism. But what I will say about Islam is as something I've studied for, you know, basically the better part of my life, I, I come from a, a scholarly family, is that Islam spread as a religion, um, very slowly. Uh, you know, there's this sometimes an assumption, and I'm not saying it's one you're making, I'm just saying just generally in terms of our, you know, pu public conversation that, you know, Islam sort of just pushed outwards and, and just sort of people just became Muslim, right? Whereas, especially before uh, uh, mass media and, and print media and printing presses and things like that, these processes of conversion and acculturation were, were very slow and very gradual and very nuanced and very local. And so as an example, when the British uh, colonized India, uh, one of the first things they did after they secured control of India is they, they did a census. And they, uh, they asked people a number of different things like tribe, ethnicity, language, so on and so forth. They asked, many, they asked also religion, are you Muslim or are you Hindu? And many people answered yes, uh, because the, the question made no sense to them. And so uh, when it comes to Islam, it, you know, it's a, it's a like shockingly diverse religious uh, community. Uh, I think the American Muslim community uh, is small. It's about four or five million people probably, uh, is, is arguably the most ethnically diverse uh, religious community in the United States. And interestingly, uh, the American Muslim community is the most ethnically diverse Muslim nationality in the world as well. Mm. Possibly the Canadian or the British may be close, but we're definitely kind of in the running. Uh, if, if you know what I mean. And so um, it's hard to make any kind of generalizations because, uh, you know, I mean, there's so many different communities, so many different practices, so many different ways of looking at things. 
Uh, a couple of things I will note though, in terms of, of modesty, one is that in, in textual classical scholarly Islam, uh, you know, what you'll note is that um, modesty was believed to be embodied. So Islam very much like Judaism, if you're familiar with the Jewish tradition, especially more Orthodox and, and I guess classical strains of Judaism, uh, believed very much that external embodiment was necessary for internal um, spiritual development. And so uh, modesty was not just in your um, demeanor and comportment, it was literally in what you wore and how you wore it. And one of the ways that actually comes up, which is interesting, is that um, in, in most Muslim cultures uh, until very recently, uh, you know, men and women dressed uh, quite similarly. Uh, you know, this is definitely something that you'd see um, in, in Gulf Arab countries uh, that, uh, you know, although women tend to wear black and men wear white, they're both are wearing basically the same clothes and, and covering their hair and appearing in very similar ways. And if you look at South Asia, uh, most Muslim men in South Asia, again, until very recently, uh, you know, would cover their heads with something, um, you know, not the same type of cloth or, or same type of fabric, but they would cover their heads. Uh, so that was considered to be part of modesty too. Uh, I think one of the big changes was that with uh, colonialism and, and the rise of global capitalism, uh, which itself was very inflected by certain gender hierarchies and assumptions, um, men were expected to work in colonial economies, but not women. And, uh, you know, as a result, what happened in a lot of these societies is men began to dress in ways similar to, to we that we do in the West, but women were expected to remain traditional. And this, and it, it's sort of like, mm. I mean, I, I hate to use the analogy because it's, it's not a precise analogy and it's a very loaded one, but it's the sort of the way that we say that, you know, some poor whites went along with racism because it allowed them to have a higher place in the hierarchy, right? So rather than accept that, hey, you know, like people are poor across the racial spectrum, no, actually, you might be poor, but you, at least you're not, you know, a person of color. And so it created these kind of hierarchies. And so something similar happened in some Muslim societies in that, you know, yes, you are subordinated to the West. You will never be in positions of influence, decisive influence. You are subordinate to the colonial authority. Um, but, you know, you, you can be the master of your own home. And so that's kind of the bargain, right? Like we won't intrude in your home life, but we will intrude in your public life. Yeah, And so it created these hierarchies. Um, but the final thing I'll say, um, you know, is, you know, it, this is where personal example and anecdote come in. Um, you know, I, I come from a family, my grandfather, great grandfather, so on and so forth were religious scholars. Um, uh, the women in our family were, were very educated as well. I mean, my mom was a doctor. Um, She's quite religious and, and in that sense, you know, quote unquote traditional. Uh, and that's been my experience of, of many South Asian families in, in South Asia and in, in the United States. Uh, and so, you know, I never inhabited that reality uh, that, that in fairness, a lot of Muslims do, in which there are clear uh, gender hierarchies and things like that, right? I mean, obviously there are forms of discrimination that are, are more subtle and, and uh, you know, pervasive all the same, but you know, I was never, I was fortunately never in an environment where the assumption was that because you were a woman, you can't get educated, you can't work outside of the house, you can't be contributing, so on and so forth. Um, you know, two of my maternal aunts are authors. Uh, you know, one of them is, uh, was uh, 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 in the uh, government, in the Ministry of Education in Pakistan, you know, things like that. So, yeah, so I, I can't do justice to the question. Um, I will say one thing that's definitely changing things very rapidly in the Muslim world, and I think we've been slow, funnily enough, to catch up to this, is social media. Um, people now everywhere in the world consume very similar forms of content instantaneously. And even at the height of colonization, when we say this at the height of Western influence, there was nothing akin to that kind of cultural influence and engagement. Uh, there was just a story in the Times earlier today about a Netflix movie uh, in Arabic, that's that's drawing a lot of heat because of the content of the film, and you know, again, something like that would have been unimaginable like 20 years ago. But I don't even know if I answered your question, so I apologize. <laughs> uh, you can always tell me that was the worst answer ever, and then uh, you know, I'll just I'll tell you another story about New York. 
<laughs> that is great. Sue Ellen is next, and then Charlie. Hello. I have uh, made the acquaintance of a couple of, of American-born women who have converted to Islam uh, for, for different reasons and at different, um, like one wears a burqa and the other one is quite, you know, American <laughs> seeming, appearing. Um, but uh, I met the one woman via a, an interest in permaculture design. And um, as a result of that meeting, I was involved with, I, I attended an event at the mosque in Clifton uh, that was built around something that uh, they called the Green Dean. And I wonder, um, I've lost track of the book that I bought, so I haven't looked at it lately. But I was very impressed with the fact that uh, th this particular strand of Islam uh, was very interested in um, matters of the earth and how we treat the earth. And I wondered if you have anything to say on that topic. Sure. Uh, so I, I'm wondering if the book you're referring to was uh, by Ibrahim Abdul Mateen. Uh, I, I think that he wrote a book called Green Dean. Uh, yes. So I'm wondering if, if that's the, the that's one. That's the name of it. Yes. Okay. 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 Yeah. So um, I actually used to used to know him quite well. It's been a long time. Uh, we lost touch with each other. And, and uh, he was always very passionate about the environment. And, and what I think was, was really interesting uh, is that um, it's sort of a larger point. This comes up in a lot of the work I do in terms of building coalitions across communities. Uh, a lot of communities and populations have sort of, I guess, for lack of a better term, organic or, or internal resources for some really important conversations. And um, if we can do a good job of identifying who the right messengers are, uh, we do find a lot of overlap in, in areas like that. Uh, there is actually um, a, a tremendous, uh, I think, you know, in, in American Muslim communities, broadly speaking, uh, you know, I think probably the last I saw about 65 to 70 percent of American Muslims voted for Biden. I think from what I've seen statistics wise, you know, climate change and the environment are our major concerns. Uh, and I do think a lot of mosques have attempted to um, make that part of programming, education, so on and so forth. Uh, unfortunately, I think that the, the, the issue is not that there aren't there there isn't a lot of relevant intellectual and, and moral and spiritual and communal content. It's that American Muslim communities uh, being extremely diverse, you know, relatively young in terms of their development in America compared to other religious traditions uh, and um, very geographically kind of just spread out. Uh, there's not a lot of mechanisms to translate those things into meaningful policies or actions. And um, in my day job, I work for a uh, communications company based in London, and we do a lot of work with Islamic networks and organizations in the Middle East around the environment. And actually, there's a lot of, there's a very strong consciousness of climate change. There's a lot of alarm, even panic about climate change, especially in the Middle East where, you know, I mean, it is a desert and there's not a lot of water to begin with and temperatures are already, you know, on, on the edge of unbearable. Uh, and so there's actually been a lot of progress uh, on these issues. And, and I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of space for American policymakers and community leaders to find partners. The challenge is really, uh, you know, it's similar to sort of the conversation around uh, the environment, climate change in China. You know, where do you, where do we, where do we promote cooperation and where do we uh, take stances in terms of human rights and so on and so forth? And, and how do we divide that line? Uh, you know, in, in the United Arab Emirates, which, you know, on the one hand is uh, an absolute dictatorship, right? Which has serious issues with human rights violations. Uh, there's remarkable progress being made towards greening their economy. Uh, and there's a lot of money being put into it. And there's a lot of serious uh, investment into solar power and, and 
so on and so forth. And, you know, that just raises the question of how do we prioritize? And I think that's a conversation that we as Americans really need to have on, you know, how do we rank these issues and, uh, you know, where do we want to maybe draw a line in the sand? Maybe I shouldn't say sand because that's like a little bit too close to home, but, um, but uh, you know, what constitutes cooperation, what constitutes collaboration, so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, but, but on the issue of the environment, definitely. I think that's something that's been pretty central to the Islamic tradition for a very long time. Yeah, cool. Charlie is next. Uh, yes, I was uh, wondering uh, what other languages you know and how that informs your narrative. Uh, I, I speak several languages very badly. Um, uh, <laughs> my mom, I remember I, uh, I took Spanish in, in high school, like, you know, many Americans and, and know absolutely nothing of the language, which is a tragedy. Uh, and then uh, I studied Arabic in college uh and uh i won't uh i i can tell a story i mean it's being recorded but that's fine I've, I've told this before so someone somewhere has heard it i i was offered an interview at a security think tank uh in dc uh that would involve arabic language analysis and uh, this was i want to say in the around early obama administration first term uh, when, you know, the war on terror was a much more kind of dominant presence in our lives. And they basically said, why don't you come down to DC? And uh, we'd like you to, you know, take a couple tests, we're going to gauge, you know, how good your Arabic is. And uh, if, if it's good enough, then, then we'll offer you a job. And I said, you know, sure, I'll, you know, I'd love to take a look. And they were a, a nonpartisan think tank. And, and I thought, you know, this is something I should be doing and participating in. And they sent me a list of preparatory vocabulary and terms and so on and so forth, right? The funny thing is that like clearly nobody had thought about what they were doing at this point. So they sent me a list of all these terms related to basically insurgency and counterinsurgency, right? With like English on one side and Arabic on the other, like rocket propelled grenade or improvised explosive device and you know, so on and so forth. And, and uh, unthinkingly, I took this with me onto the plane, you know, not <laughs> imagining that there would be any sort of issue involved and I, you know, while I was sitting on the plane and it's a short it's a short flight from uh New York to DC uh I decided to start studying mm -hmm. and uh realized uh about like 10 minutes in that the man next to me had basically stopped breathing right that he <laughs> you know he was pretty sure it was like the end of his life right that, you know yeah, like what yeah. what could possibly be happening right now um <laughs> And I will say I've never seen a person get off a plane so fast in my life. <laughs> and I'd like to think that I've, I've fundamentally changed his life because he went home and, you know, had a new appreciation for everything in his life yes. and all the, all the good things he had. Uh, but it, in all seriousness, you know, it's, it's actually uh, in terms of studying language and, and appreciating what's happening in the world. Uh, I think absolutely uh, you realize how much is lost in translation, how hard it is to say things and communicate things and share ideas. And, you know, as a simple, as a simple example, and that has kind of has had very deep ramifications for how people see the world. Uh, I was living in Egypt studying Arabic uh, about 20 years ago. And uh, went, I used to go to movies because they'd be subtitled and it was a good way to practice, you know, and it was a little bit more interesting than sitting with like a bunch of flashcards uh, in your apartment. And uh, the expression nobody knows doesn't exist in Arabic. Uh, the expression is God knows. Because mm -hmm. how can nobody know, right? Like yeah. there's nothing that God doesn't know. So yeah. by definition, God knows, right? Not nobody. Uh, and, you know, it's a, it's a small thing, but like language is so infused with religious uh, significance that, you know, your daily life is much more centered around certain spiritual values and ideas uh and you know really it it, it is in, in our society for for better and for worse yeah good going yes uh is your book uh, i want to make another please take a look at this book or get his book how to be a muslim an american story has it been translated into other languages Sarit? i actually was just approached by a uh a woman who works in translation in the middle east who wants to translate the book into uh, Arabic yeah. and uh, 
you know, we are having that conversation, uh, but I, I don't know what'll come of it. Uh, you know, obviously there's copyright issues and yes. publication houses and, and so and so on and so forth. Yes, good, thank you. Chuck, you're next. Yes, uh, thanks for coming, Haroon. Sure. Um, as Americans don't know a lot about a lot of cultures, we tend to come up with stereotypes. Uh, are there any stereotypes about Muslims that you just can't really understand where they came from? That just really aggravate you, maybe? <laughs> Aggravating. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think it's, it's definitely gone better. And certainly in terms of, uh, you know, younger generations, there's a lot more exposure in terms of culture and, and access to global media. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's a bunch, uh, you know, one that often comes up is the assumption that Islam is an ethnicity. Uh, so, you know, if you're a Muslim, you're Arab uh, or, or something of the kind. Uh, the first Muslims in, uh, um, in, in America in any appreciable number were uh, African, um, about 10 to 30 percent of the slaves who were, were forcibly transported here uh, were Muslim. Uh, although, you know, how much of that Islam survived is, is debatable and, and hard to tell given, you know, the, the paucity of historical records. But that part of the story almost like goes entirely missing uh, because of immigration and, and conversion and other communities, the demographics have changed, but probably still about 20 to 25% of American Muslims are, are black as an African American in origin. Uh, increasing numbers are West African immigrants or their descendants. Uh, but, you know, I mean, probably the most famous Muslims in American history, Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X, come from that, uh, that history and that legacy. And it's unfortunate that that, you know, goes kind of like completely out the window uh, because, uh, you know, I, I think unique among Western, uh, Western European, North American sort of, you know, countries and sites, other than East, uh, a few countries in Eastern Europe, uh, America is actually quite unique uh, insofar as it's really the only country where a significant percentage of the Muslim population has deep historical roots in the country, right? Like predating the country. Uh, that is not the case in Canada, right? That is not the case in the United Kingdom. That is not the case in Australia. That is not the case in France. Um, obviously, those populations are, you know, Canadian, British, French, but they're not they don't have deep historical roots in the same way, uh, in the same numbers, in the same percentage, and and that's something that is that is unfortunate. I think um, the second is you know the assumption that uh, all Muslims are, are fit into one stream, so they're either you know all religious or all conservative or all this or all that. And actually, the American Muslim community is is shockingly diverse. Uh, you know, I it, it's funny. I think um, in two thousand. Uh, about 74% of American Muslims, it's estimated, voted for George W. Bush. And in 2008, about 89% voted for Obama, right? So you can kind of see how that one flipped, right? Um, and then in, but then in 2020, I think uh, by self-reporting, you know, of course, that's the only way we know, 35% uh, of American Muslims voted for Trump. Uh, wow. which is a lot higher than, than you know, many people expected. Uh, and yet, for people who had their ear to the ground in, in American Muslim communities, it was not that surprising. And it's sort of of a piece with uh, what we've seen in some other uh, communities of color where there was actually an increase in votes going to Trump as opposed to 2016. And, and you know, the assumption that just because someone is a certain ethnicity or a certain religion, they're just going to vote one way, is actually really dangerous, um, you know, just from an organizing point of view, because you're yes. you're losing people, and and uh, you know, I mean, for all kinds of reasons, one doesn't want to do that. Uh, and then the final thing, I'll just say, this is kind of funny because this came up in an event like a few weeks ago, where it's funny. You know, Richard said you put some self-effacing humor in the book, and and I said, yeah, you know, I, I like to do that. And I'm a I'm a tall brown man. I've been told I have resting extremist face. Uh, which apparently is like a thing, right? So if you kind of tell some jokes, people think you're not going to kill them. So like it kind of lowers the tension, right? Um, but uh, um, I, this woman actually told me like, I didn't know Muslims told jokes. And I wanted to be like, you think like 2 billion people like never tell jokes? <laughs> Isn't that like a little weird, right? Like 2 billion people just never tell jokes? <laughs> I mean, I know plenty of Muslims who do not have a sense of humor. That's fine. But like, you know, I'm, my family is ethnically Punjabi and, and we're like always ribbing each other, um, you know, making fun of each other, making fun of ourselves, you know. Um, uh, you know, I, I have an uncle who, uh, I mean, just in terms of comic relief, like he's about 6'5", 
He's a long beard, quite conservative religious, um, also a hardcore democracy activist uh, in Pakistan, um, very uh, politically liberal in, in certain respects, very religiously conservative. And he used to run a number of factories for Victoria's Secret. <laughs> and he used to show up in the U.S. on business trips with suitcases full of lingerie. <laughs> and I just thought it was the funniest thing in the world because they see this guy and think, you know, he's about to kill everyone. And then he just open up his suitcase in their <laughs> underwear. And he'd be like, they're samples for work. And, you know, but my point being that, you know, like it, if you have a very narrow conception of who people are, then you can inhabit those kinds of stereotypes. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, it, it you know, and, and I don't mean in a pejorative sense, but like, if you think to someone, if someone actually says, oh, I didn't know Muslims told jokes, what you're basically saying is like, I didn't know Muslims were people, right? Like humor is like a, obviously everyone has different types of humor, but you know, I, I can't imagine there's a culture in the world that doesn't have humor. Uh, that's, you know, about as, as, as basically, you know, human as you can get. Um, it's no different than love. It's or, because terrorists don't have a sense of humor. This is also it, true. Yeah, it, yes. yeah exactly. It, that's and the so equation. therefore, yeah, therefore everyone is, you know, that stereotype. So, right. you know, but uh, the final thing I'll say is I, I think it's very much a question of, you know, hearing people out and understanding that people don't necessarily have that exposure. And, and for me personally, I try not to react um, in a way where I'm upset um, because I, I do think, uh, you know, um, as a minority, and given the importance of these conversations, you know, if you if you know something, you have a moral obligation to share it. And and what's the point of sharing it if you're sharing it in a way that no one's going to hear it? Uh, then you're just turning people away. And you know, I mean, in and of itself, that's bad. But when you're in a minority and you're vulnerable, like that's just kind of self defeating on top of it, right? Because you know, I that person doesn't lose if they remain in a prejudice, right? Maybe in the long term they do, but in the short term, like I'm the one who's actually losing in a more substantive way. Yes, yes. It's a political group and, you know, and progressives and all. We really care about the vulnerable, the ones that are less fortunate. And that's, of course, a strain in different religions as well. And yeah. then there was a person that I learned in reading that only the first hundred pages, which I'm fascinated to continue reading your book. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. Julabid, Julabid or something like that, J-U-L-A-Y-B-I-B. -B. How do you say that, Karun? Uh, Julebib. Julebib. Yeah. And uh, that was a person that really was, I came to that part uh, in the book and I read about it and I thought, oh, that is so cool. And then his relationship with Muhammad. Uh, would you mind sharing? And is, is there something about the vulnerable that is part of the, uh, the Muslim tradition and particularly how you use that story in your uh, in your book mm. sure so uh you know the um my apologies if i'm if i'm redundant or or uh providing too much background but for people who aren't familiar with the tradition um kind of the the last significant and and kind of normative religious figure in the islamic tradition you know as a matter of consensus is the prophet muhammad uh, peace be upon him who lives in the late sixth, early seventh century in, in Western Arabia, uh, in a kind of in a geopolitical backwater, for lack of a better term. Uh, you know, he's he's born in Mecca and, and uh, flees in the in the Muslim exodus to a city 250 miles to the north uh, called Medina uh, and lives his life basically between these two cities. And, you know, what's really important to understand about formative Islam and the Islamic consciousness is, uh, you know, one, that, that society is not, it's not part of the Roman Empire, it's not part of the Persian Empire, it's not part of the big kind of sophisticated states of the time. It's a very simple tribal society, uh, but it's very much living on the margins of survival, right? I mean, these are not wealthy societies. This is not fertile land. Uh, this is not like, there's not abundant rain or water, right? Like everyone's really struggling all the time. And so uh, there is a, a very strong consciousness in Islam of mutual obligation and oh, yeah. mutual assistance, uh, in part because, you know, I mean, I've, I've, I've never lived in a pre-modern society, so I, I don't know for sure, but like, I imagine that, you know, if you're living in uh, a very green, well-watered place, life is, you know, probably easier on the whole than living in a desert. Um, and so, you know, if people aren't part of strong social units and tribal networks, and they're on their own, uh, they're really vulnerable, uh, because, you know, they're, 
I mean, you, how are you going to survive, right? And so basically, and, and this is a challenge in terms of how Muslims live this out in the modern world, this is a, an ongoing question, but, but effectively, uh, the society into which Muhammad was born was very biopolitical in the sense that your tribe, your lineage, your ancestry uh, very much determined your place in the hierarchy, gender as well, uh, ethnicity, so on and so forth, but it was really your kinship networks, right? So-and-so is the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, and that had a major determinant on what opportunity you did and didn't have. And if you were not born into a prestigious tribe uh, or, or any tribe, you were basically entirely on the margins. And so the, the gentleman that, uh, or the, the historical figure that Richard was referring to is a man named Jalabib, whose actual given name in Arabic means ugly, uh, which is, you know, tells you like, that's how, that's how little he was thought of in the society that he didn't even have a name. He was just called ugly uh, because he was not, you know, he didn't fit the, the standards of the time. And what Muhammad did uh, as, a, as a religious figure in Medina is he basically posited that instead of belonging to a tribe based on your ethnicity and your lineage and your kinship, that Islam was a tribe. And so it was not your origins or wealth that brought you membership to the tribe. It was your assent to or agreement with a certain set of propositions and, and values and behaviors. And so, you know, in, in one sense, it's radically egalitarian because everyone can be a part of it. Uh, of course, it's more demanding in certain respects and more exclusive in other respects, right? There's, there's uh, you know, uh, challenges and opportunities in, in every social structure, I imagine you could say. Uh, and he posited this as an alternative to the tribal kinship-based structure and created an ummah, a global Muslim community uh, that, you know, where your, your loyalty, uh, you know, even to the sense of who you fought for and died for was determined by your faith, not your blood. And how that then relates to the modern world and nation states and democracy and things like that is, is an ongoing and, and challenging question in, in, many, in many societies, by no means all, but, but you know, in a fair number. And uh, I think that's also a challenge for uh, people from uh, a Christian background sometimes uh, because the Christian tradition, you know, Jesus lives in the Roman Empire, right? There is a politically stable social order that he exists in. And so uh, his life context is very different from Muhammad's life context. And so the, the founding values and emphasis and, and uh, priorities of the traditions as they develop are different. Uh, one is, is seeking a space within a political society. The other is trying to create a political society. And so, you know, there are incompatibilities. Uh, I don't yeah. know if I answered your question. Why did, did you bring him in? Because when you brought him in, then oh, I thought that, that was so, you know, the name is interesting. And then the, the way you described it, why did you bring him in? Do you recall? I know, you know, you wrote the book a number of years ago, but what is he, how is he important for you personally? Well, I think for me, so I, you know, I, I very much grew up uh, as, you know, very isolated kid, you know, in a lot of ways. Uh, I had a lot of health challenges when I was young. And then, of course, I was the only Muslim kid. I was in a very homogenous high school. Uh, there was one Jewish student, and there was myself, and then pretty much everyone was, uh, you know, some kind of Catholic. Uh, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I did not, I did not, I should be very clear, I did not experience any, any meaningful hostility. I mean, I experienced a lot of, you know, casual ignorance, right? Like, one of my closest friends, uh, a kid who had been friends with since sixth grade, um, I found out when I was in 12th grade that he thought I was black. And I was very confused. I was like, how do you not know? <laughs> right? Like, did you not notice like my parents have an accent, right? Like, <laughs> like what, what do you think is happening right now, right? Um, but, you know, but again, I, he was also a very good friend, right? Like he just had no, he had no con context yeah. or consciousness of, of these historical realities and identities and experiences. And, you know, that can, you know, one can say that's unfortunate, but I don't by any means think it was malicious. Um, and what I'm trying to say is I think that it, that experience kind of created me a consciousness of what it's like to be on the outside and on the margins. And it was tempered by the fact, and, and this is where I think America is such a fascinating, complicated place. You know, yes, I was a minority and, and I was widely misunderstood and, and it was alienating. Uh, also, my parents were doctors. And, you know, I, I said it jokingly in the beginning, but, you know, like my parents thought I was going to go to Yale. Uh, and because of their socioeconomic status, their educational background, so on and so forth, 
um, these were considered viable propositions. And so, you know, on the one hand, yes, I'm a minority. On the other hand, I'm, you know, another kind of minority, right? Like I'm, I'm privileged in ways that most of my white Christian peers were not. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, that my hope in sharing the story of Jalebib is, is one that we realize that sometimes, you know, who we are in that story. Are we, are we the person who is marginalized or are we the person who has the ability to bring that person in yeah. and welcome them and create space for them? And second, are we creating systems or societies that have, uh, you know, room for uh, people's humanity? Uh, yeah. You know, in, in the story of Jalebib, I think what's so powerful about it is that, uh, you know, when Jalebib dies, uh, he's killed in, in a battle, uh, you know, the prophet Muhammad goes to his companions and says, and goes from like group of, goes around the different groups of people on the battlefield and says, who have you lost? Who have you lost? Who have you lost? And after a while they realize like he's, he's thinking of someone in particular, he's not saying their name yeah. and no one like Jalebib is so far out of the consciousness of people that even among his own quote unquote people, nobody remembered that he was even there. And he keeps saying, I've lost someone, I've lost someone. And finally, you know, they kind of just give up and say, you know, like, we don't understand. And he says, I've lost Jalebib. Wow. And what he does in that moment is he refuses to let anyone else bury Jalebib. He buries him himself, which is, you know, kind of a, it, it is a, uh, a punitive measure in a sense, right? It's emotionally um, painful because, you know, he's forcing them to, to, to keep their distance. And he's saying, you know, you, you forgot this person in life. I'm not gonna let you like, remember him in death, right? Like you wow. made a big mistake. So you have to own up to it and live in this awkwardness right now and watch me dig his grave alone and think about, you know, who is in your consciousness and who is, is not in your consciousness, right? So I think, uh, you know, we don't live, I think, you know, by and large in communities that are that small and intimate. I mean, we, we just don't. There's more people in Mason, Ohio than there were in like the entire Muslim community of the uh, early seventh century. But at the same time, you know, do we have societies that have that level of concern? And, you know, for me, I think one of the issues that was always very powerful to me was health insurance. You know, as someone who had a lot of health issues when I was younger, uh, I think, you know, I, it, it was never lost on me that if my parents had not been doctors, I have no idea how they would have afforded, you know, that, that treatment. And, and I mean, just having a doctor in your house is you know, kind of a, uh, a, a nice privilege. Uh, and so I, I think that I share that story out of a sense that there's a lot of emphasis on what religion, you know, is supposed to do in terms of excluding people. There's not really as much emphasis on religion as a form of inclusion. Yeah. Wow, thank you. It meant a lot to me. And then now you're really filling in the, some of the areas there. Who's next with a question or comment? And remember, Haroon said, nothing is off base. You can ask anything smart or dumb uh, or uh, uplifting or embarrassing. We are free in our relationship with Haroon. Who's next? Okay, I'm going to go. The oh. Oh, yeah. Mary Carol, please do. Hi, Mary Carol. Hi. So it's good to see everybody. I so apologize for being late. I had just gotten home and I jumped on my computer. Oh, good. Um, so this may have already been said, but I see a friend of mine um, on here. I'd sent this um, link out to several people. Have you talked about or has anybody asked about the question of the um, is the Islamic Center's uh, Meet Your Neighbor opportunity? Has that been discussed here tonight? No, no. Okay, so, so yeah. I won't I won't call this person out unless she wants to be recognized. But I have over the years had the phenomenal opportunity to go to a number of their, and I believe that is the name of it, Meet Your Neighbor. And um, I've taken friends, I've taken my family, I've taken friends from my church, and it is it's just it's a wonderful um, way to be in the, the most beautiful mosque and to um, uh, meet with people, kind of an open forum like Haroon is offering tonight, asking questions and just a chance to dialogue and, and meet, yeah. meet people, eat some of the lovely um, 
food that they pastries and things like that. But if people don't already know about it, yeah, it's an I invitation. guess what I would have to what I would have to check is with COVID. I'm not sure if physically they're able to do it, but if they resurrect it, I really right. um, highly recommend it as an opportunity. Oh, as a follow-up to this discussion. And Haroon, I have to say, the one thing that I thought of when you said that people don't think Muslims tell jokes. <laughs> so I'm always reminded of our daughter who's now has children of her own. We, her kindergarten teacher, we went out to dinner one night to a pizza restaurant and she saw him and she said to me, she said, teachers eat pizza? I mean, it was so, and so when you told that story, that's all I could think of was, you know, Muslims tell jokes, well, teachers eat pizza too. Yeah. So thank you. I'm thoroughly enjoying this. And I was also able to be there on the wonderful January 6th memorial. So thank yeah. you. Hope to set that up. A lot of the setup was through with Mary Carl and the uh, sheriff's uh, um, honor, honor core and uh, all. So, Maroon, what about that uh, meet and greet or the open? Is that a mosque that you go to sometimes? Or? So, I, I know the program. I, I, th I haven't, I, I actually wanted to uh, check it out and participate, but, you know, as, as Mary Carol had said, uh, because of COVID, um, I, I don't know if the program was running, but, you know, even um, uh, our family has kind of pretty much limited, you know, a lot of our engagements and things like yeah. that, which is, you know, one of the unfortunate uh, just kind of, you know, realities of the moment we're living in. Uh, but I, I do think it's a great program and, and um, I've heard very good things about it. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad to hear that corroborated. corroborated. I don't know if there's anyone here yes. uh, from the Islamic Society yes. of Greater Cincinnati, yes. but if, if they're willing to jump I in. I see Shabana, Shabana has, yes. her, has her hand raised now. No, we still uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Harun, Aslam alaikum. How are you? Welcome, Aslam. How are you? Good, good. I'm just thoroughly enjoying um, this evening's talk, and I'm actually um, reading your book right now. So I, I don't. I hope there's no uh, spoiler alerts, but um, I, I'm enjoying it. So I just wanted you to know that. And I wanted to thank Mary Carol for bringing up Know Your Neighbor, um, and I'm inviting all of you um, to come Ooh. to the Islamic Center. Our next Know Your Neighbor event is on um, the first Saturday coming up in March, which I believe is May 5th at one o'clock. So you get to, as Mary Carol shared with you, come to uh, learn a little bit about the faith, um, observe the prayer, and um, hoping um, by March 5th, we can you know, um, share food with you as well. Um, we love to share uh, food with our guests. So please do come out for that. I, I um, help um, uh, run this event. So you can reach out, reach out to the Islamic Center of Greater Cincinnati and RSVP and let them know that you'll be attending. I look forward to seeing all of you. Thank you. Yeah. That's a wonderful invitation. Yeah. Yes, I know Shabana. I'm gonna Try yes. yes. Yeah. So just thank you. And I, and I know it wasn't meet your neighbor. I just couldn't pull the name out as okay. know your neighbor. No, yeah. it's um, okay. But um, I'm so glad that you were on the call tonight. Shabana is one of the people that I sent the, um, the invitation to. So yes. Shabana, it would be good to see you. I'm going to try and make that happen. Yeah. I would love to see you. Okay. We'll I'd, love, I'd the, love to see all of you. We'll go to the website. We'll, uh, we'll get that out as an open invitation. I think it's so important for us to uh, know our neighbor and to learn and expand and connect and, and working together raises hope is a line that I like to use. Marty is next. Oh, hi again. <laughs> um, I grew, I hardly know any American Muslims, although there are a few uh, business people that I've gotten to know. But um, I had the wonderful fortune of teaching a, a number of children of Saudi Arabian families that were here for me their children were for medical here for medical care, and the whole family would come, and the families were the most. Oh my God, the most loving people that I especially got close to one family who not only was loving, but the most humorous and just joy filled mm -hmm. family. So I know there's, and of course, this is the Saudi family, you know, they, the women totally covered, you know, there were 
as a woman, I could be in their home, you know, which was a real privilege, I felt. But, you know, there were times when the, the girls would be peeking out the window because they couldn't show themselves in the window. I mean, it was just... It was a different experience, but anyway, I was sort of wondering how, as personally, and of course, different cultures have got to be different, but I was just wondering about the personal interactions in a Muslim family. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, again, obviously cultures are, are so different. Uh, I think, um, you know, again, my family ethnically is Punjabi. Um, uh, my my mother's side, my father's side, my my wife and her family, uh, and so you know I, I think um, so much of this is shaped by historical realities and conditions. I think Punjabi societies tend to be very, uh, I wouldn't say matriarchal, but have are very strong women um, and who play very dominant roles in you know maintaining the family and and kind of setting the the kind of um, social relationships of the family in, in certain directions and things like that. Also, you know, Punjabis historically were, were mostly farmers, so they were pretty rooted in a certain place. And they sort of, you get the son of the soil type dynamic, like very earthy kind of humor, things like that. Um, and, you know, and, and there's so many differences. I mean, you know, Pakistan alone, uh, where, you know, my family's from, you have like five major ethnic groups. You have, I think at this point, probably about 210 million people, which is, you know, just kind of hard to believe considering the countries, I think about the size of Texas, uh, you know, wow. physically. Um, and, and you know, but, but those differences are really important. And, and I think that's what I think creates a lot of the confusion. And, and to go back to earlier points is, you know, what, what brought these communities together, uh, you know, were certain historical experiences. And, you know, one of those was uh, the fact that, you know, if you look at the American Muslim mosaic, Right. One of the things that these very different populations have in common, I mean, you know, Shabana, it, and I'm, I'm honored you're reading my book, but, you know, she mentioned the Islamic Center of Greater Cincinnati. And, you know, if you go there for Friday service, you see people from all over the world. Right. So just the diversity in the prayer hall is just kind of mind boggling. One of the things that these communities have in common is that historically speaking, um, they're all, you know, colonized populations. Right. They're the descendants of colonized populations. Right. But how that history unfolded is also very different. So there are certain similarities in terms of mindset and perspective and so on and so forth, uh, which are then tempered by how history played out. Uh, another major event is, of course, 9-11. And, uh, you know, I had a friend who used to joke that 9-11 uh, converted more people to Islam than, than anything else, because suddenly, whether you were secular or religious, you were treated in the public's eye as a threat. Um, you know, an, an undifferentiated mass, right? You were all the same, you were all dangerous, you all need to be watched. And so it created this sudden um, surge in American Muslim solidarity that hadn't been there before. But as we move away from 9-11 and as new, you know, threats and realities and opportunities present themselves, that solidarity is fading, which is why I think, you know, for example, in 2008 and 2012, overwhelmingly American Muslims went for Obama. And now that we've moved farther and farther away from that, uh, you, you, you know, that it's, it's like what happened politically with, you know, one out of three American Muslims, is, as far as we know, going for Trump, right? It just, it doesn't feel as, America doesn't feel as existentially threatening anymore. And so people are now fragmenting based on their historical experiences and things like that. Um, I, I will say the food thing, though, definitely, we like to feed you. Um, that's like a, that's like a common thing. That's a, that's a, a Muslim norm. Like if, if, you know, if you don't feed your guest, preferably to the point of indigestion, you have failed as a human being and God will punish you. Um, I think that's pretty much a, a universal Muslim value, which is why I say, if you have to fly around the world, fly on an airline from a Muslim country because they will feed the hell out of you. Um, because even on a corporate level, they feel kind of like, like embarrassed, like, oh, we didn't, you know, we didn't feed our passengers. Um, you go on American Airlines and you're lucky to get like, you know, a stale bagel. So just saying. That's right. Sue Ellen. Um, well, I, I don't know if I missed this at the beginning, but I'm, I'm not clear what your day job is now. Are you a writer? Are you a leader in a particular mosque or um, what do you, what's your day job? So my day job is I work for a, a PR and communications company. So I, I don't do anything 
I, I suppose it's exciting, even if it's confidential, but, but basically it's a London based company and we have clients from all over the world. Um, many of them from, uh, Southeast Asia, West Africa, and Europe, uh, currently uh, doing a big project for one German client and one Singaporean client. Uh, and, uh, you know, most of our staff is, is in London, some are in Dubai, uh, some more and more actually in, in Pakistan. Uh, but, you know, because I, I actually started working there during the pandemic. And so I've never really, I, I know some of the people personally, but it's, for anyone who's been working, you know, a new job during the pandemic and they're working from home, it's sort of a strange experience to not really know any of your coworkers because everything's entirely virtual. Um, uh, I, I was joking with my wife that, you know, one of the problems with working for someone who's really wealthy is they don't understand your life circumstances and they sometimes don't seem to understand reality. So my boss is actually an old friend of mine and he's, he's British, he's of Pakistani origin and he's addicted to traveling. And, uh, you know, we were, we were chatting on WhatsApp and he let slip that he was in DC. And I said, oh, you know, like how long are you in, in the US? And he said, oh, I'm here, you know, through the weekend. And I said, hey, you know, like, do you want to come watch the Super Bowl? Right. Yeah. Like, it'd be really fun. I was like, Cincinnati's in the Super Bowl. It'd be like a cool experience. And, you know, I said, just, you know, you're more than welcome to come and, you know, we'd be happy to host you and this and that. And he, <laughs> he thought that like, I was, I was going to the Super Bowl, right? <laughs> and so he's like, oh, aren't the tickets sold out? And I was like, no, I meant like come to our house, man. Like we're, not, we're not showing up in LA, like I'm not spending $10,000 on a ticket, right? Like, you know, um, he like didn't understand, but it, as it turned out, he wasn't available. But um, that's my day job. I, I do write. Uh, I, you know, I used to be much more into social media, like Facebook and, and Twitter and things like that. I, I mostly, um, I, I quit Twitter cold turkey and, and Facebook only sporadically. I started a Substack uh, a couple months ago, which is kind of fun. I can share that um, uh, for anyone who's interested. It's just about, you know, kind of my life um, in Ohio and, and what it's like, you know, being who I am and where I am and things like that. Uh, but writing is a passion, uh, but it's not my day job. It's, yeah. Uh, What's your discipline now, Harun? Here you have a family and you have your day job. How, what, how do you, I'm always curious how writers create the discipline or the focus to, to get the writing done. I had a, a, a friend who, um, she's actually uh, quite a prolific writer. I don't want to say who she is because I don't know if she wants me to quote her, but she's written some New York Times notable books. Like she's a, she's a pretty remarkable woman. Um, she, she is Muslim, incidentally, um, who often said writing was like vomiting. Um, and, and I was like, oh, like, come again. Yeah. Right? And she's like, you know, it's like, she's like, you know, you're a writer if writing is like vomiting. And I was like, well, what does that mean? And she's like, you know, when you need to vomit, you don't want to vomit, but you know yeah. that you won't feel OK until you vomit. Yeah, that's right. She's like, so if it's a compulsion that you can't just you cannot get out of your system, no matter what, even when it makes you feel terrible, like the last thing you want to do is wake up at six in the morning when you have an idea in your head and sit there and write, but you have to do it. That's how you know you're a writer. You just, you can't not write. It's a, it's like, right. a, it's a passion, yes, but it's also an obligation. Because if it's just a passion, you'll only do it, you know, sporadically. If it's a compulsion, then it's like, then you just, it's, it's what you do all the time. But it feels good when you get it out. I mean, oh, it that's... feels great. It does. Yeah, very much like vomiting. Yeah. Yes, that's right. That's it feels much like better. Yeah, you yes. feel yourself again. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Constance is next. Uh, thanks. I never thought I'd be like laughing with tears in my eyes <laughs> from attending this. Um, but um, so I, I'm a I'm a Democrat. I'm a strong Democrat. I'm always yes. pushing Demo Democrat stuff. Yes. And um, I'm really distressed that you said one out of three Muslims went for Trump. And I'm wondering if as Democrats, we're not reaching out enough to the Muslim yes. society yes. for group culture. Um, and if there's a, you know, how, how can we, you know, I'm sorry, Charlie is, he's smiling at me like, oh, you're always pushing this stuff. No, it's a good okay. idea. It's a good question um, for him. But, you know, how can we reach out and be able to talk? You know, of course, you know, I, I know it's like, you know, I'm, I don't want to push like 
the propaganda, but of course I am pushing the propaganda. It's like, please don't vote for people like that. You know, um, can you help? Yeah, you know, I, I think it, it, it's, you know, I, I think there's, there's a few things happening, right? So one is that, you know, if you look at the American Muslim community demographically, right, about one in five are African-American, as in, you know, have been in this country for decades, if not centuries, right? Like centuries, really, right? And that community really kind of came into its own as an assertively, identifiably, proudly Muslim community in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Um, probably the vast majority vote Democratic, right? Um, yeah. Even there, you see, I mean, what we saw, for example, in New York City with, with Mayor Adams, right? Like you have, you know, are we center left? Are we, for lack of a better term, progressive left? Is it a Biden thing? Is it a Bernie Sanders thing? Like, what is a Democrat, right? Like that is itself um, a major, you know, issue. Um, I think that there's a few things happening. One is, you know, a lot of, like my parents, for example, um, in the 1990s, uh, which is when I, when I became conscious politically, so to speak, right? That's when I was in high school and college and things like that, um, were Republicans. Um, obviously the Republican party of the 1990s is not the Republican party of right now. Those are, those are two different things. But, you know, for an immigrant population that was upwardly mobile, quite economically successful, um, well-to-do, it was not rocket science, right? Like you voted for the party that lowered your taxes uh, or, you know, ostensibly lowered your taxes, right? Um, when George W. Bush ran, um, you know, a few things were happening. Uh, one is, and some of it, I'll be honest, was latent anti-Semitism. Some of it was poor decisions by the Gore campaign. And some of it was a conscious decision by the Bush campaign to say churches, synagogues, and mosques. It's a small thing, but for a community that's been basically like left out in the cold, suddenly someone paying attention to you is like a really big thing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this was again, you know, pre 9-11 and, you know, nobody really, a lot of American Muslims did not realize they were people of color because socioeconomically they were not. Um, although it was very divisive within the American Muslim community and there were a lot of very contentious conversations over who was gonna vote for who. Uh, I think, you know, in terms of understanding American Muslims now, I mean, I think there's a lot of people for whom anti-Muslim sentiment is not really that powerful or considered a major priority. Uh, you know, some of it is the fact that, I, I don't think it's a lot, but some of it is that a lot of, a fair number of Muslims are much more socially conservative. And so they find themselves gravitating to the right. Some of it is the fact that for immigrants from countries that are authoritarian, um, you don't like the idea of big government. If you hear the word socialism, it's scary. It's not like a positive thing. It's sort of like what happened with Cubans in Florida. Like there are no positive connotations there that anyone is activating. It's, it's not like a friendly, you know, touchy feely kind of thing. Um, I think some of it is just lack of engagement. It's, it really is. There's, we're not really talking to people. We're just assuming that, oh, because you're a minority, you're gonna vote for Democrat. Like it doesn't really, I don't think it works that way. And I think, you know, there was a big wake up call for Democrats in 2020. And, you know, I will say just to, to kind of knock on the American Muslim community a little bit, a lot of the influencers who have sort of presented themselves as voices of American Islam in the last 15 or 20 years are, are from coastal bubbles and are not paying attention to their own community and just assume that because this issue is important for me, it's important for everyone who looks like me, right? Which it's not, right? Mm. Um, and, uh, I think it's just about spending a little bit more time trying to get to know the communities, get to know the, the animating concerns, right? Um, if you are like, I'll give you a small example. Um, with our um, our older two uh, two daughters, they're teenagers, right? We sometimes have like conversations about what's going on with Muslim communities around the world, and one of the issues that's come up a lot is is the Uyghur, uh, the Muslims of, of Northwest China, where you know, according to the Biden administration, Canada, Netherlands, so on and so forth, there is a genocide underway. Uh, the Uyghur Muslims are being hurt. About a million Uyghur Muslims are in concentration camps in Northwest China, right? Um, 
<clears throat> the Muslim majority world has been completely, <clears throat> almost completely silent about this because they're all in debt to China, literally. Um, and so they, they do not dare say anything that will upset, you know, the, the bank, so to speak. Um, and, you know, one of our daughters pointed out that there's actually a few Uyghur refugees uh, in the public school system here in, in Mason, Ohio. Right. And they've they've come here as asylum seekers and, you know, they're they're like brand new. Um, and I said, you know, obviously that's not numerically representative of the vast majority of American Muslims, but just take this isolated instance. Right. If you are from this population. Right. Who was the first politician in the world who called out what was happening to your people? It was actually Donald Trump. Right. Like we look at Trump and see X, Y and Z. But if you are existentially threatened and in a situation where your family members are disappearing and suddenly a country, not just a country, the United States of America opens its doors to you, validates what you're going through and offers you asylum and a place to live and now is like going to bat for you for whatever. I mean, one can argue it's cynical, this and that, right? Like that's, you know, although I will argue, it's also worth pointing out that there's continuity between Biden and Trump on this, right? Both administrations call this genocide, right? So it's not like a, it's not like a partisan football issue, right? Like there's obviously something happening here. Um, like what is your relationship to America conceptually at that point? Do you see what I'm saying, right? Like yeah. th these are very different realities, right? Yes. So, um, you know, we're talking about Afghan refugees who are coming to the United States in, in relatively large numbers. Again, not huge numbers for a country of 340 million people, but within the dynamic of American Muslims, right? How are they going to identify with America? What is their relationship to America going to be? What is their relationship to American politics going to be? And when you have these hugely diverse populations, albeit small, I think it's just really important not to assume, and I think this is something that a lot of people on the left do, that color of skin equals certain type of politics. Yes. And, and it does not. Right. Right. And, and, you know, we know, I know we all know that, but I think it's just very important to be really patient and pay attention to that. And, you know, for populations that are um, upwardly mobile, there may be certain concerns. A lot of American Muslims are quite poor. They have completely different concerns, right? Um, a lot of American Muslims who are black, Islamophobia isn't as pervasive a reality as racism is, right? Because when they have an encounter with someone that is racially charged, that person is probably not understanding that they're Muslim. They're, the, the encounter is charged because they're black, right? Um, and so they're perceived to be a certain, you know, a certain person, right? Because of what they look like, not what they believe. Um, many other Muslims can pass for white. And if they didn't have, let's say a headscarf on, they would, you know, um, and then, you know, and I don't personally believe this. I, I think Trump did a lot of damage to the United States. I think, unfortunately, from an electoral point of view, a lot of that damage is going to take a long time to come to the surface because it's corrosion in our institutions mm -hmm. and our norms mm -hmm. and things like that, which doesn't just, you know, it's not like on day one, everything went to hell. But, you know, when you when you sound the alarm and then it's not an immediate disaster, some people think that you're just, it's the boy who cried wolf. Yeah. Right. Um, it's sort of like, you know, and again, I don't think this is true, but it's like with climate change. Right. If you tell people you've got two years before like humanity is extinct. Right. What you're actually saying is like, hey, like we are going down a path that is getting progressively worse. And like it is going to get more and more painful for more and more people and harder and harder to turn the ship around. Right. Some people process that as, oh, like, you know, I'm, I'm fine. Right. And so this is what happened in some American Muslim spaces, kind of, again, anecdotally that I've heard that people would say, oh, you know, you said that when Trump was elected, we'd all be in like camps. And like, meanwhile, I made more money last year on the stock market than I did like in the 10 years previous. So like, actually, this is not that bad. Right. So, yeah. you know, and uh, again, like I said, 65 percent of American Muslims voted for Biden, um, you know, I don't know. I, I think a lot also depends on who, I have no idea who's running in 2024. I mean, I guess I know who one guy is running, but like, I don't know, like is Biden running? Is Kamala running? Like, I don't know. Um, and so uh, that will have a major impact too. Yeah, know. that's right. Thank you. Mary Carroll is next. Um, so this is really more a question just generally to either Haroon, you, Richard, or anyone else. Are you familiar with the work that Mala Patel and Lisa Kwan are doing in Liz Cooley? Um, so 
and I, and I don't want to exactly speak for them, but it might be interesting, Richard, to have them come on and speak. Yeah. So what, what they are doing after returning from the Women's March, you know, several years ago, realizing that um, they felt that um, as a community, the, um, the AAPI community wasn't as engaged in the political system. What, say, started, what the AI, pardon me, a, a, say what the a, AIPI is, community is. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. Sure. So, but what does that mean? What are those letters mean? It's the Asian American Pacific Islander. Thank you. So, but the point is when, when um, uh, Constant asked the question about, you know, the political engagement. So, what has evolved from there? They actually created a PAC that have, um, has uh, supported some progressive candidates, including yes. our new mayor, including our sheriff. But more importantly, they have started a research project to reach into what they feel is an underrepresented population who have not been as engaged in the political system, not to try to influence them as much as to try to ask questions. Yes. What are you concerned about? What matters to you? What what are you looking for in your elected leaders? Yes. So that, I mean, just what you said right, right there, Haroon, is, you know, some people look at it and say, I wasn't too bad off in the last administration if what's important to me is that I want my retirement investment to keep growing or, you know, whatever. But, but I'm really, I'm really excited about the work that they are doing. Yes. And, um, and it's all about trying to engage um, a population that at least they have identified as being less than engaged and just sort of keep voting the same way maybe they always have because they don't, they aren't somehow getting information that might help inform yeah. a different vantage point. Yes. So I'm Thank just, you. if you don't already know about it, and I know Richard, you know, Mala, yes. it might be really interesting to have uh, Lisa and Mala and Elizabeth come on and just talk about the work they're doing. Yes. Uh, uh, Mala did come uh, not all that long ago to one of our sessions to start to talk about this. Yes. And the research and uh, that work. Yes. And I want to, it's a good reminder though, Mary Carl, to follow up with her. Anything to add about that from your uh, viewpoint, Harun? No, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm not familiar with that work uh, in any detail, but I think it's, it would be really cool. Um, yeah. It would be fascinating. Uh, to hear We're that. down to our last four minutes and thank you. The time is just rolling along. Uh, but I'm interested in mid-April, your second book comes out and I want to make sure that I get that. Two billion caliphs a vision of a Muslim future. Now, two billion caliphs. I thought a caliph was kind of a, a leader or a, a, a someone who followed uh, Muhammad and all that. Tell us what the definition is and how two billion caliphs. Uh, that's a big group. That's a big party. So, so uh, echoing Shabana, I don't want to throw any spoilers out there, but <laughs> but I will say this. I think that uh, you know. Um, I feel like the Muslim Muslim communities worldwide, uh, whether yes. minorities is in the U.S. or or majorities, as in you know places like Pakistan or Egypt or Turkey, uh, are in the middle of a really, really historically significant kind of civilizational transformation. Wow! Uh, there's like a really big question as to uh, who are we going to be. Yes. I think what we saw in the last 20 years is you know a very small minority of extremists dominated the narrative yes. and have, have, you know, at, at great cost burned themselves out and, and yes. basically died off. And, and the Arab Spring pretty much largely failed mm -hmm. and political Islam failed with it. Um, whether one thinks it's a good thing or a bad thing, that's a, you know, a entirely different debate. But I think the fact is the Arab Spring basically is, is over. Mm -hmm. And there is a wave of disillusionment kind of rippling over the Muslim majority world, as well as a very profound shift in Western Muslim identities. And I think in Europe, it's a little bit more charged given the size of populations, national and ethnic identities overlapping in ways they don't necessarily in the US and things like that. But you know, even like I said, in the US, the 9-11 moment, even for American Muslims is over, right? Like if you ask 
you know, American Muslims tend to be younger than, than many other American demographics don't even remember 9-11, right? It's not, it, it's like, if you ask me about Pearl Harbor, I know it's historically significant, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have a deep personal meaning for me. Right. Uh, and so I think that it's this inflection point. And this book is an attempt by me to say, hey, like we as a global community of 2 billion people have, uh, we have an opening right now yes. where we get to decide who we want to be for the decades and centuries to come. And Two Billion Caliphs is an attempt to take a very old concept in the Islamic tradition and kind of move it around and play with it a little bit and make it uh, the basis for a new definition of Islam, which is much more egalitarian, much more democratic, much more communal, much more local and much more organic. Uh, yes. I'm not interested in big global narratives. I, I don't think that they, uh, I don't think they work. And I certainly think in a community of 2 billion people, they're, they're nothing but a recipe for a disaster because uh, yes. you're just constantly trying to force people into boxes. Uh, and so the book is, I mean, there's a little bit of memoir. I'd like to think there's a little bit of comedy. There's some philosophy and history, <laughs> but it's really a polemic. It's an attempt to say, hey, you know, we have a chance here to do something different, right? Like the, the last 20 years have not been pretty, uh, but there is an opportunity to do something better. And let's take it, let's seize the moment, let's do something inspiring and exciting. And, and I think for people who are Muslim, it's immediately relevant. But even for people who are of different backgrounds, different faiths or no faiths, I think it's relevant insofar as, you know, this is about 25% of humanity we're talking about. Yes. And so, you know, where, where those communities go, uh, a lot of other people are going to be impacted, you know, whether they want to be or not. Uh, we, yes. we simply, nobody's an island. And, uh, you know, we're on an interconnected planet that we've seen in the last two years. And so we should want to at least know what's happening, if not be part of the positive conversations and pushing back against the negative ones. So yeah, it comes out April 12th. Good, yes, Beacon Press, April 12th, uh, 2 billion, how do you say the word, caliphs? Caliphs, yeah, caliphs. you got it, yeah. yeah. A vision of a Muslim future. And of course we've talked about uh, his first book, How to Be a Muslim. This has been recorded, if you find this valuable, Please, it'll be on the Bold New Democracy uh, YouTube channel, but it'll also be in the next agenda uh, for our uh, upcoming Tuesday night, you know, the recording link. Um, and if you would uh, email me the sub, uh, the uh, sub stack. Sure, um, sure, we'll do. Your thing there, because uh, uh, I've been feeling, following Timothy Snyder, if you know Timothy Snyder. Sure, the yeah, historian yeah. From yeah, Yale. Yeah. From Yale, so yeah. he remembers you. But the uh, 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 on Substack, and it's really been uh, uh, valuable. But I'd love to include yours as well. So, sure. Haroon, thank you so much. I love your your approach, your energy, your love, your humor, the depth of your being, and your and you. your teaching. So, uh, thank you. Any way we can support you, let us know and pop on sometime if you're free on a Tuesday. Oh, I'd love night. to. I'd love you're to. Thank you. I love that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a great Thank night, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time out. Oh, Thank yeah. You. It's been fascinating. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Really touching and inspiring.